We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. Things can go wrong in seconds. When you're out in the boat, every minute counts. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people, ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the pager goes off, your body's full of adrenaline. OK, guys, go, go, go. There's potentially a family out there with somebody missing. No, I don't know. Okay. If it hadn't been for them, I, I wouldn't be here today. We'll get you out of here. They definitely saved my life. Yep. Equipped with their own cameras, the crews give us a unique insight into every call-out hey, as only they see it. You're doing really, really well, buddy. Guys, we need to get him in. Get him in, get him in. For those who risk their lives, it has become a way of life. Come on! To know that you've helped save a life. Let's get you in! It's such an awesome feeling. Oh, oh! Lying on the eastern coast of Kent is the small community of Woolmer. Woolmer is a lovely place to live. In the summer, we, our beaches are packed, lots of ice cream parlours, we've got the arcades, all the classic English seaside things. The lifeboat station here faces onto one of the narrowest parts of the English Channel. Our Atlantic class, 85, has a range of approximately 90 nautical miles at full speed and the channel's only 22 miles wide, so we have a big patch. We can get anywhere fast. In recent years, local lifeboat crews have found themselves regularly called out to groups of people attempting to cross this perilous stretch of water. The shouts which I've been on involving small boats in the channel, none of them have been safe journeys. You reach out, grab their hands, at least 70 people are thought to have drowned trying to cross the channel in the last six years. These people are getting into this small boat, making the crossing, and they've got no idea. They're hoping they're going to make dry land, but they don't know they're going to. And it's not just men, it's families that we're seeing, women, children, and even babies. <laughs> These crossings are being attempted in the busiest shipping lanes in the world, the Dover Straits. The shipping that come through are huge. Looking from the beach out to sea, you don't realise how big they are. They look like blocks of houses floating in front of you. And these things don't have brakes. They can't just stop. They take two miles to stop. Some of these small boats could be hit by a ship, and the only time you know about it is when bodies wash up. Mid-December, a clear, sunny morning. Temperatures overnight have barely made it above freezing. We had a metre and a half seas, 20 knots of wind. It wasn't very pleasant, it was about four degrees, so it was, um, it was pretty freezing cold, really. Despite the conditions, crews from neighbouring Dungeness, Ramsgate and Dover have already been called out to a major incident involving a small boat with multiple casualties. Four people have died and 43 others have been rescued after a small boat carrying migrants got into difficulties in the channel in the early hours of this morning. We woke up and we found out that it was a small boat ended up sinking off the coast of Dungeness. And it hit home, really, that something like that can happen literally on our doorstep. And it makes us think, well, we have to respond to to a, to a mass tragedy event. Just seven hours later, at 11 o'clock, the Coast Guard receives reports of another small boat in distress in the middle of the shipping lanes, this time just off Woolmer. When we found out what was going out to, regarding the weather it being so cold, we were sort of planning for the worst, hoping for the best really when we got there. The worst would be the boat taking the water, people ended up in the, in the water, and sea temperatures and wind chill, you're not going to last long at all. 
The station's Atlantic class is prepped for launch, with Dan assigned as helm. So if I'm the person in command of the vessel, my first thing is, right, what crew have I got? What experience do our crew members have dealing with this sort of situation? Luckily, the first few in the door, they had a lot of this sort of experience as well. So I know I've got a really strong team behind me. Within 10 minutes, the warmer crew are rushing out to the small boat's last reported position, eight and a half miles southeast of the station. You go out, you don't know what you're going to face, and you don't know what you're going to find. The water around this coastline, it's freezing cold. If you're on a small boat and you end up in the sea, all of a sudden you've got this huge, huge, you know, <gasps> the panic set in and a few deep breaths of, of water and you're going to drown. Half an hour after launching, the lifeboat arrives on scene. Everyone OK? A border force vessel is already here and is attending to the inflatable boat. We're sent as a backup to border force. Generally, we stand by. They deal with the, the situation. And if they feel it's challenging conditions, they'll ask us to assist. And if they need us, we'll come in and help. It was evident that the swells had picked up. You've got this great big border force boat which is rocking left to right. The small boat was obviously moving quite a lot as well. And this small boat is, is absolutely swamped. I think we've roughly counted 45 people on board. So I'm, I'm just assessing this whole situation. I'm thinking, right, I, I really want to make sure that the crew are well briefed. OK, so what we need to do, guys, is prepare ourselves for the worst case scenario, which is multiple people in the water. You also get people getting crushed. Although the border force vessel has a small platform at its stern, it's a real challenge to transfer this many casualties across in these conditions. The boat, there was lots of people shouting and screaming because they wanted to get off the small boat and they wanted to get onto border force. So there was quite a lot of panic. You could sense the panic in the air. Keep an eye out for people in the water. We're watching. Look at this guy. Whoa, 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 person in the water. And suddenly seeing panic on the boat. The casualty boat has punctured and is now taking on water. That's when we realised it was sinking. These people are now trying to climb to escape their own boat. It looked like chaos in there. You're not going to die! Go down. OK, go that way. No! Let, let go, lad. Let, hold on, hold on, listen. They're fighting for their own lives now. Hearing them when they scream for help, you realise how desperate some of these people are. Hey, hold on, hold on. James, wait there, wait there, wait there. We now found ourselves in this extremely stressful situation. While the Border Force crews recover as many casualties as they can from the sinking boat... Grab hold of this! Get hold of it! The lifeboat crew attempt to save those in the water with the help of self-inflating horseshoe rings. So when they hit the water on impact, they inflate. Just one per person! Yeah, that's going to be your lifeline. <laughs> one metre! With the sea temperature in the channel at just nine degrees, cold water shock can take hold within minutes. I've got you, I've got you! Leading to an increased heart rate and a drastically reduced survival time. <sighs> OK, it's calm down. Calm, OK? You're safe. Listen, listen, you're safe. When people are in small boats, they're sat in a certain position for hours on end and they lose the use of their legs. Let's get you out of the water, mate. <laughs> so when they find themselves in the water, they can't even kick their legs, let alone help themselves into the lifeboat. One, two, three, four. Ah! OK. Oh, one person, keep an eye on him, please. Okay, let's get back over there then. Okay, we've got a guy hanging off the stern. Let's go for him, please. Grab hold of that. We've got people near the engines. The fear is, is they get caught up in that machinery. What's that? Okay, back away. Slow down, slow down. 
Don't panic, my friend. We're fine. We've got you. There's definitely a lot of pressure being a helm. I try and be as cool, calm and composed as possible because I think if I'm the person who's, who's leading this shout and I'm panicked or I'm worried or I'm fearful, that's only going to instill fear into the rest of the crew and the casualty. Oh, I've got you, I've got you, I've got you. Keep your head above the water, you're fine. The warmer crew have now recovered five people from the near freezing sea. We need to get the bag out and wrap them up. But the last casualty pulled from the water suddenly takes a turn for the worse. OK, right, let's get him up. We need to work on him. Let's get him into the deck. Our last casualty, his eyes rolled in the back of his head and he was out for the count. We don't know what's wrong. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yo, yo. Hello, hello. He's had a few mouthfuls of water. Back in my mind now, I'm thinking, is a secondary drowning going to play a part in this? He's unresponsive. Oxygen out. As his heart stopped beating, I'm thinking, I'm going to have to commence CPR any minute now. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. So I was just about to start CPR. OK, wait, wait. He's drinking, he's drinking. Hey, listen, listen. We've got you. OK, calm. 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 All of a sudden, his eyes just flicked on, and it was like, and that, to me, was a massive sigh of relief. OK, keep your eyes open. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Eyes open now. Dan then starts talking to him, and we see a hand move. <laughs> OK, uh, the orange bag's probably in here. The concern now is he's absolutely freezing cold. He's shivering. We need to do our best to use the kit we've got on the boat to prevent this from worsening. OK, we're going to have to do this. OK, just to keep you warm. What I don't want to do is this casualty to sort of drift into a state of unconsciousness. Can you hear me? All you need to do, my friend, is keep your eyes open and keep looking at me. The casualty's probably similar age to me. I could probably relate to him as a friend, you know, a cousin or something like that. So I just want to make sure that he's going to be all right. The most important thing is you're safe, OK? So by me talking to him all the time and, and reassuring them it's all going to be all right, it's going to be fine, and all the time I've got eye contact with him, then I know that, you know, he's with us still. The five casualties on the lifeboat are now all conscious and stable. And Border Force have successfully brought the other 40 or so onto their boat. What we're going to do, we're going to get you onto a bigger boat to get nice and warm, OK? I'm commanding the boat now at this point. We need to get them onto a, a vessel where they've got shelter. So what we had to do was uh, request that Dover lifeboat assisted us. Not only can Dover warm these casualties up in their larger seven class, in these conditions, it's also a more comfortable journey back to the paramedics on shore. Dover's on its way here. OK. Crews, everyone OK? Casualties OK? You need to keep your eyes open, OK? Have to keep your eyes open, my friends. You can't take your eye off the ball because we're, we're still in the shipping lane. We're still in a very busy place. You know, you're looking over your shoulder and you've got a great big tanker coming down you. If we get all of them casualties off first, it means that all of us can then deal with this guy, OK? Getting nice and warm now, my friends, yeah? Good. You look a lot better than you did five minutes ago. Dover lifeboat has now arrived on sea. So Junior's put our Atlantic 85 alongside Dover lifeboat. The crew are all ready. And we've now gone to move the casualties from our boat to Dover lifeboat. Well, guys, this is one to be concerned about. These casualties have obviously lost the use of their legs. They're freezing cold. So we've had to make sure that we've given them a helping hand to get them from our boat to the other boat. Good effort. That's a good one. The very last casualty to be transferred across is the young man who fell unconscious just a few minutes earlier. OK, he's very, very cold, so he's going to need to be warmed up as quick as he can. Go, go. Go, OK, clear. 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 OK, guys, let's just stop. We now pause. We have a breather. It's important to have an immediate debrief to find out how the crew are, to have a look around the boat and be like, are you OK? Are you OK? Are you OK? That is an extremely stressful situation with people in the water. And uh, you all handled very well. Amazing effort. Well done. Well done. 
Good effort. I've had my fair share of uh, quite gnarly shouts over the years, but this shout is right up there, you know, with the most pressure I've ever felt as a person in command of the boat. Good shout, guys. It still sits with me hearing these people say, I don't want to die. But we made sure that five people haven't drowned, and that's enough for me. However, for the warmer crew, this shout isn't over yet. I looked around the crew and I said, do you all want to go again? Everyone good? OK, cool. They were like, yeah, we're good to go again. And then we went on to the next one. Just three miles away, another incident involving a small boat is unfolding. It doesn't matter where a casualty is from. Um, a person's a person. They need saving, and if they need help, they're not going to go and help them. On this second tasking, the transfer goes smoothly, and so the lifeboat remains on standby. You sat in a closer position to watch what's going on. I think we've roughly counted 40 plus people on board, and it went smoothly. So, yeah, a relief to not have to do it a second time. Once was enough. After five hours at sea, the warmer crew finally returned to station. I'm immensely proud of all the crew. They all gelled together as a team that day. And every single one of them, amazing. It's hard to sort of explain sort of what's, what your emotions are. I tried to separate myself. You start to dwell in on what the outcome of them is when it'll start to affect you later on. People are very quick to pick up the paper, you know, and see negative press regarding small boats. And I, I genuinely feel if you saw someone's arm up in the air and they're just about to go under, you, you want to help them and make sure that they can make it back alive. We don't discriminate who we rescue because it's about helping people who are stuck at sea. The sea will take you. The sea doesn't discriminate. So we don't discriminate. In the 200 years since it was founded, our NLI crews have saved the lives of over 146,000 people. But even with all that experience behind them, these shouts often balance on a knife edge. No two shouts are the same, ever. We're not worried about the boat. Take my hand. We can go from a situation where everything is in control one minute to suddenly all hell breaks loose. A lot of things go through your head. You try and account for anything and everything that could go wrong. So we're going to come to you. Stay where you are, yeah? At the end of the day, you deal with what you've got out there and just hope that your training's set you up well. You OK? I thought I was going to die. You're all good. Things can escalate very quickly on a shout. You always have to be prepared for anything on the lifeboat. I mean, it just can change so quickly. It can be scary, but you just hope that you can make the right decision that saves that person's life. He's breathing. Come on, darling. Open them eyes. South Devon, lying between the rivers Tamar and Plym, is the naval port city of Plymouth. Plymouth is a big city on an uh, amazing bit of coastline. With a long maritime history, Plymouth has had a lifeboat since 1803, 21 years before the RNLI was established. Plymouth's home to two lifeboats, a 7-class ALB and an Atlantic 85 ILB. We've got rivers and estuaries, close coastal areas which suit the inshore boat, but we also cover a patch up to 100 miles offshore. Beyond the safety of Plymouth Sound, this stretch of coast is directly in the line of storms rolling in from the Atlantic. 
it can get fairly rough around here, particularly outside the breakwater. We've got a big breakwater that protects uh, most of the water inside Plymouth Sound, so that can be a bit of a false sense of security when it's a calmer day inside. There can be some quite big swell outside. Plymouth's breakwater is a 5,000-foot sea wall set in the middle of the estuary. On its western edge, a deep channel can create strong currents on a changing tide, especially around Penlee Point. Penley Point's one of the headlands, uh, so it's just to the west of Plymouth. There's a pretty rugged bit of coastline. Very, very jagged rocks. You wouldn't want to take a boat ashore there. The end of May. Mid-morning on a cool, overcast day. The Plymouth crew are paged. Sunday, so I think I was just around at home sorting a few bits out. So it was just a matter of jog around the corner to the lifeboat station. With the tide just starting to rush in, a small fishing boat is drifting without engine power close to the rocks at Penlee Point. It was fast launch. The boat was all prepared when I got down there so we could get straight on and go. Eight minutes after the pages sounded, Plymouth's Atlantic-class inshore lifeboat heads out to sea with a crew of four on board. They were in the vicinity of Penley Point, which means that that's not a good place to be stuck without an engine. Breaking down near Penley Point is far from ideal, and if they can't get that restarted, there is a chance they'll end up on the rocks. So it was important to get out there as soon as we could. As they rush to the boat's last known location, the crew receive an update from the Coast Guard. One of the men on board the fishing boat is diabetic. He's having a hypoglycemic episode and his blood sugar levels are dangerously low. The diabetic casualty hadn't uh, had his medication with him. Diabetes can be quite serious quite quickly. We treat it as if it could be a worst case scenario and it's the sort of thing where somebody could end up in a coma. After several minutes scouring the seas for the casualty vessel, the crew finally spots something. We saw a boat matching the description of our casualty being towed by a, a passing rib. So we sort of stopped, and, and that was indeed our, our casualty boat. It was a small fishing boat, I'd say. It's the sort of boat that people go out on for the day rather than out to sea for, for a couple of days at a time. Although another vessel has now towed the fishing boat away from the rocks, the medical emergency on board is ongoing. One of the first things we see was a guy lying on the aft deck of the boat. So the assumption that we made then was that um, this was our, our arm whale casualty. As soon as they arrive on scene, Sam and Cameron transfer to the stricken craft. All right, all right. But it turns out that the man at the stern is not the diabetic casualty. Where's the guy having the hypo? In there. Okay. We climbed straight into the wheel, asked to speak with the skipper, who was not able to move around the boat that easily. It's not very nice in there. Okay. Behind us. Not very well. Hey, mate, you're going back. Yeah. The diabetic chap that morning, he'd forgotten to take his drugs and he hadn't eaten particularly well, uh, which has caused his blood sugar to drop. But I took four a day. Yeah. And what did the time was doing? I am got nothing. Okay. You're low, are you? Yeah. Yeah. The chap was poorly, so there was certainly a, an element of concern there. He looked a bit light on his feet and a bit not quite with it. The crew must raise the diabetic man's blood sugar levels as a matter of urgency. So we've got some sugar paste, oh, which will bring your levels straight back up. Lifeboat crews carry a basic sugar gel in their first aid kits to give them time to get a diabetic casualty to paramedics. So on the boat, we carry glycogel, um, which is essentially pure sugar in a toothpaste. It's really good at bringing blood sugars up quite quickly. And we'll squeeze a whole lot back into your teeth. Yeah. All right. Taste me in, but that'll get your blood sugar levels we'll straight up. Diabetes is potentially is a, a life-threatening condition if it's not treated in the right way in the right time. How are you feeling? Better? better yeah. So within a couple of minutes of him having the first sort of dose of, of glycogel, he became a lot more alert, almost back to himself. As the boat that came to the fishing vessel's aid continues to tow it into shore, 
Sam heads to the mysterious third casualty at the boat's stern. All right, mate. What's up? Ill. Just sick? Yeah, that's something sick, yeah. OK. Um, have you had seasickness before, have you? Yeah. OK. Is that what you think it is? Yeah. The seasick chap, he was basically caught out by the broken down boat. There was a, a bit of wind chop, so with him having no engine power, he's, he's sat sort of beam on, rolling in the sea, um, and it can be really quite uncomfortable. Meanwhile, Cameron keeps a watchful eye on the diabetic casualty to ensure his blood sugars don't drop again. How are you feeling? Better or do you want another sugar gel? No, I don't want sugar. All right, but as soon as you start feeling like your peak again, we're going to have to break one of those tubes. All right. So if he was deteriorating, we'd, we'd see him become less lucid. He'd start potentially losing consciousness, trying to hold himself up. So that's really what we were making sure didn't happen. Uh, yeah. Do a cap refill. OK. A capillary refill check is essentially, uh, we check how good their circulation is. So essentially, we would push on their forehead um, and you monitor how long it takes for that colour to come back. That time, tell us how unwell we need to consider them to be. Come, it was three seconds when you asked me to do cap refill. It's up to three, is it? Yeah. It's just increased. Yeah. Despite the sugar gel, the diabetic casualty appears to be having another hypoglycemic attack. The chap was poorly, so there was certainly a, an element of concern there that we needed to get him some professional help quickly to stop him deteriorating any more than he was. So we took the decision this chap should probably come off, just in case it's something more serious that potentially we're missing. With the man's condition rapidly worsening, Cameron and James decide to rush him ashore in the Atlantic class while Sam remains on board the fishing boat with the other two casualties. We're going to have to put a life jacket on first, I He was pretty light on his feet. Just watch your head. Yeah, there we go. A little bit wobbly, um, which is the benefit of having two of us on the casualty boat. It's two pairs of hands, and off we went. That minor or high pulse was nothing like I had that day. That was the worst one I've ever had. And I didn't realise really how serious it was. That day, old friends Glenn, Paddy and Sean were taking their newly purchased fishing boat out on its maiden voyage at sea. We wanted to go a few miles out just to go out early in the morning and come back as late as we possibly could and have a day's fishing. We got the boat with a galley on it, so we have cups of teas and coffees and talks about what we've been up to during the week. With calm conditions forecast, they opted to take their small inshore fishing vessel out beyond the mouth of the estuary in search of mackerel. This is the first time we ever took a boat outside, and so we decided that day just to try it, see what she's like. We did a little bit of fishing, not much success, so we decided to steam out a little bit further. So we were about two miles offshore. I recall we getting out to the breakwater and it started bobbing up and down. I thought, cool, Jesus Christ, this is a bit rough. The tide and the wind were now combining to create unusually large swells just out to sea. The boat started to roll a bit and I couldn't get to the anchor, which would have been the sensible thing to do, being an amputee. Lost my leg approximately 10 years ago. So I'm very limited to what I can do, which is why I really need my friends, Glenn, Paddy, and others help me. I've never seen a boat rock and roll like it in all my life, and I've had a load of boats. That's when I started feeling, oh, I feel a bit like wheezing myself, yeah? And, and then things just started going downhill from there, really. Now, out of its comfort zone, the boat was soon struggling. Then, its engine broke down. When the engine cut out, I thought, oh, no, here we go. But a failed engine and seasickness were just the beginning of the fisherman's woes. The next minute, I just went all funny. I thought, oh, my sugar, um, my sugar levels just dropped. I think I'm going to have a hypo. That's when I started being sick then, and they couldn't stop being sick. Engineless, their small boat was now within 100 metres of the rocky coastline. I looked at the rocks and I thought, oh, my days. We are going to be smashed up here, yeah? 
With his two fishing companions incapacitated, Sean wasn't able to rely on their usual assistance with the safe running of the boat. We tended to share the duties on board, but I was normally at the helm because it was more comfortable for me being disabled. But this day, I decided that it was time to, to get help. So he shouted to me, Glenn, ring the iron and I, because we're going to drift into the rocks. So I said, all right, I'll ring them, not knowing that I never had my phone with me. And it turned out he was talking into his glove. And quickly, I realized he must have been hallucinating. He said, you're talking to your hand. I went, what are you on about? And then I just went funny again. So then I decided to, to get onto the radio, because we were now only about 50 yards off the rocks. I was on the back of the deck on the floor, thinking, oh, my days, someone are hurry up and rescue us. Fortunately, a passing boat offered the three friends a tow into harbor. And within 20 minutes of being paged, the lifeboat crew were boarding with first aid kits. Next minute, all I can recall is opening my eyes and seeing a man with a white helmet. Hello, mate, how we doing? They must have thought, what have we got here, Matt? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Just watch your head. Yeah, yeah there we go. 45 minutes after arriving on scene, the Plymouth crew brought Glenn into the harbour. After being checked over by a team of paramedics, he was deemed well enough to make his own way home. It was a job well done. We, we got him ashore and we, we saw the recovery that we wanted to see. So, it was, yeah, it was really good. Could have been worse if they'd ended up on the rocks, because at that point, you've got essentially three people that aren't capable of really looking after themselves. Soon after, the fishing vessel was towed into harbour by the other boat, with Sam, Paddy and Sean aboard. At the end of the day, if it wasn't for the RNNI coming to us, I think I might not be been here today, you know? If I was fit enough, I would have come a volunteer for the RNNI, but I haven't got the sea legs to do it. I'll be puking over I'd be sick over the, over the people more than I would be rescuing them. <laughs> the shout was unusual. It's unusual to get sort of three characters like that in that scenario. I haven't seen them out fishing, which means either they've not been out fishing or they're not getting into trouble anymore. <laughs> One hundred and forty miles away on the west coast of Wales. Nestled between the Cambrian Mountains and Cardigan Bay is the town of Aberystwyth. Aberystwyth is an absolutely fantastic place. One side we've got the sea and a, and a massive playground that the sea provides us, and actually not very far away we've got uh, hills and mountains. It's one of those places, it's the end of the train line, so people tend to sort of um, head to the sea. And historically, I think uh, Aberystwyth was always a, a holiday destination from the Midlands. It was the surge in leisure activities here in the 1960s that led to Aberystwyth becoming one of the first RNLI stations to trial a new inshore lifeboat. When we did the initial trials, the younger crew, crew members uh, really thought this this was a good idea. The boat was faster, you know, the response time was greater, was more maneuverable. But a lot of the fishermen and boatmen down the harbor said, oh, that rubber duck will never come to any good. And now, of course, we know that the inshore lifeboats are the mainstay of the RNL. The station here now has two, an Atlantic 85 and the smaller Arancia class rescue boat. The main reason why the inshore rescue boats are so helpful around the coastline is the ability to get in right up onto the rocks. The coastline around Aberystwyth, we've got lots of quite steep cliffs with sharp, rocky reefs. And so at low tide, they're great to walk along. But uh, as the tide comes in, they get completely covered up. Six p.m. on an overcast May bank holiday. I arrived at the station 
and uh, there was already a couple of people down there and they'd been informed that it was someone with an ankle injury at the bottom of one of the cliffs. A person has fallen on the rocks in Clarac Bay, nearly two miles north of the station. We've got a voice for the wait. Within minutes, the crew launch both their boats and head towards the cliffs. OK. Yeah. Once we launch, we're starting to think about what we might be needing to do, who's got the, the most sort of medical experience, if we're going to need to do any medical tasks. And we're just kind of thinking all of the possibilities that we might encounter. We know that they're fairly close to the water's edge, so there's obviously a concern what the exact location is and uh, how serious the injury is as well. Five minutes after setting off, both boats arrive on scene. Straight in, straight in. The casualties are at the foot of the cliffs, but with shallow water and submerged rocks, it's only the smaller, more manoeuvrable Arancia that can make it ashore. What we did then, we picked up an, another member of crew, so I was able to then take in two members of crew to start assisting with the casualty extraction. He moves it in, Paul, we'll beat you. Yeah, OK. Right. So as I took the Arancia in closer to the shore, I could see that there was an opportunity near where the casualty was situated to be able to manoeuvre around the rocks. We could see the Coast Guard and ambulance with the casualty already. But it wasn't until we got a lot closer that we actually realised that uh, one of the paramedics was Bryn, who's also a helm on our crew. Bryn and the paramedics have already been on scene for 15 minutes after responding to the 999 call from the casualty's daughter. So when I arrived at the casualty side, I saw the patient lying down, trying to support her leg. Her daughter was there also. It was quite apparent that the casualty was in a lot of pain. I could see that there was deformity in her lower leg and an obvious fracture there. Once I established that her basic observations were fine, it's quite a priority to get her some pain relief and make her more comfortable. It was as though somebody was sticking loads of needles, loads of needles in me. I was frightened as well. That was making the pain worse. It was really uncomfortable to watch your mum in that much pain because she's, she, at that point, she's helpless. Denise and Jody down from Worcestershire for the weekend had been walking along the rocks when their day suddenly took an unexpected turn. I've walked that place for many years, and that particular time, my foot just slipped. I just thought I'd twisted it, didn't think I'd done any damage, but it wasn't until I'd actually looked at my foot and it was the wrong way round. That's when panic struck in then. Her ankle fractures are so severe that Denise has been given Penthrox, a powerful pain reliever, to ready her for evacuation. You could see that the pain was easing a little, but now we had to get her off the rocks. At the foot of a steep cliff and with the nearest beach several hundred metres away, the crew's immediate challenge is to work out how to extract Denise to carry that patient across those rocks would have been extremely dangerous for the casualty and for the people carrying her. The easiest option was to take the patient onto the lifeboat. Better only 85 and pull back to the marina. Once she's on the boat, it's your guys pull, really. Having one of our crew members as part of the, the paramedic team, um, it, it does assist with that sort of decision-making process because he knows what our capabilities are, and he also knows the, the condition of the casualty, and he knows how that might play out with any form of extraction. The decision is made to take Denise to Aberystwyth Marina, which means carrying her on to the Arancia and then transferring her to the Atlantic 85 out at sea. It was really hard to watch her be lifted and, and taken away because at, at that point, I'm thinking, I still need to be with her. I need to make sure that she's OK. Okay, go then. You're looking up at the sky and it does make you feel as though you're not in control because 
your feet aren't on the ground and you're relying on somebody else. It's quite daunting. They don't know what's going on. So we do communicate with the casualty and just trying to tell them it's, everything's okay, really, and just sort of checking their welfare. But getting Denise off the beach is the easy part. Now, around 100 metres out, the crew still have to transfer her across to the Atlantic 85. There are certain risks involved when you're transferring any casualty from one vessel to another. Right, who's going to hold what here, then? Denise has two hands in the boat, two hands on the stretcher. It's important that everybody knows what they're doing. It's important that anything you do is coordinated and it's done in one swift movement and it's done with minimal risk. We could secure them together, couldn't we? We'd have no hands on the boat, then, wouldn't we? We managed to secure both vessels together by use of a yacht harness. Then that freed up hands then to enable that to transfer. OK, boys? OK. It's not going to tip, is it? Watch your arm there. All good? Do you want to go with them? Yeah. With Denise now securely on board, the Atlantic heads to Aberyst with Marina, one and a half miles down the coast. They made me feel so safe, and the journey didn't seem long at all. No sooner I got on the boat, they were taking me off the other end. Put your hands in, please. Just over an hour after falling on the rocks at Clarach Bay, Denise was passed on to the ambulance team at the marina and rushed to Bronglice Hospital, a mile away. Once you've um, handed that casualty over, essentially your work is done. And there is definitely a moment of relief to think, right, we've passed it over to another set of professionals that are now going to pick up the baton and help with that recovery. It was overwhelming how quick the response was and how much that they were able to, to do and, and to resolve the situation. The importance of Team O'Connor's shout was very high and it was demonstrated by how well the job went working with the Coast Guard, the Ambulance Service and the RNLA. An X-ray confirmed that Denise had broken her ankle in three places. She had an operation to fix it involving four metal plates and 16 screws. I still can't believe that that little slip and I've done all this damage. I'm hoping that I don't need to be rescued ever again, <laughs> but I am just glad that they are there if anybody needed it. Seventy miles away on the northeast coast of Wales is the resort town of Rill. It's a nice seaside town, very busy in the summer, um, very much a holiday destination. The Rill lifeboat has been watching over this popular stretch of coast for 172 years. Rill's lifeboat station is situated in the middle of the promenade, and we house Shannon class lifeboat and we've also got a D-class with a tractor launch as well. The town faces directly onto one of the widest parts of the infamously rough Irish Sea. And the waters offshore can be stormy and unpredictable, even in summer. Coastline and rail can be quite dangerous at times. Weather conditions can change in an instant. On rough days, there could be swells up to two, three metres just from the tide. Adding the wind onto that, it becomes a lot more treacherous. For the many vessels passing along this coastline, there's now another danger just offshore. The vast banks of wind farms providing electricity for local residents. Rill has three offshore wind farm fields, so there's an awful lot of wind turbines within three mile range of eight mile. Vessels can navigate the wind farm with extreme caution. It's something we probably wouldn't recommend that you would navigate right the way through there. There's a lot of structures that could be hit, especially if your vessel has engine failures. Late August, a rainy evening with strengthening winds. So I'd had a very busy day at work. I'd come home, thought I'd get an early night. And um, just as soon as I got into bed at 20 past nine, the pager went off. 
the wind, it was blowing a good four seven, I would say. It always heightens your awareness when the wind's blowing quite hard. The Coast Guard has received an emergency call from a yacht that's lost engine power in the storm offshore. All we got told was that he was drifting and he was really at the elements of the wind and tide at this point. Within minutes, Rill's Shannon-class lifeboat is launched. Due to the position and if it was drifting towards the wind farm, then obviously we've got a, a risk of collision between the wind farm and its yacht itself, which then we could end up with people in the water. The crew must locate the yacht as a matter of urgency. However, in large seas and with limited visibility, this is turning out to be more complex than expected. The distance we knew we were going to find the yacht, probably about 10 miles to run, so there's no way that you could see the yacht visually at first. So all you're relying on is the information that they've given. But the yacht's main radio has been water damaged in the storm, and the signal on the skipper's handheld VHF keeps dropping out. We know what we're looking for, but with it being dark and the swell, the boat's always pitching and the yacht's always pitching, so it's a little bit harder to, to spot the yacht. With only limited radio communications, the crew can't find out the condition of the casualties on board the yacht, which is being blown ever closer to the wind farm. So we prepped all the tow lines ready when we got a little bit closer because we knew we probably wouldn't have a great deal of time before the yacht entered the field. Even though the yacht is now showing up on the lifeboat's radar, the crew out on deck still can't see it. Initially, it was quite hard to pick up, and uh, the yacht actually had a strobe light that they switched on, which um, once we got a little bit closer, we could see that quite, quite clearly. Half an hour after launching, the Shannon class arrives on sea to find the boat now roughly half a mile from the wind farm. The yacht was being thrown all over the place by the waves, and they were, they were getting battered. One of the things we were really concerned, it was the skip of the yacht moving from the cockpit to the front of the yacht. You could tell he was tired, the way he was struggling to walk around the foredeck. The yacht had drifted further towards the wind farms. So they could have had minutes before they were in the middle. So we needed to get him out of that danger. Yeah. So the plan was we were going to get a tow line on them very quickly and pull them clear of the wind farm. The task of getting the tow line across to the yacht in 40 mile an hour winds falls to Dougie. It's all about timing, really, because you've got two different boats that are pitching at different levels. One's going further away and one's trying to come a little bit closer. And obviously the wind was racing through, it was howling. So it's just trying to make sure that you commit and you get that line over first time. He managed to catch it first time. It's a massive sigh of relief from, well, from myself, especially from throwing the line. Although now under tow, the yacht has no engine power, so it's struggling for control in amongst the two-metre waves. One of the main things you need to be considering about the, with towing the yacht is that you need to make sure that you're towing the yacht to its safe speed. You can very easily tow too slow. Fingers clear. Watch that line. The yacht looked like it was being in a large washing machine. And you could see it going round and round and from side to side. They're getting battered here. So we had to slow right down to make it safer, make it easier on the yacht. With the tide now starting to go out, the crew opt to bring the yacht into the deep water channels of Conway Estuary. Conway is 15 miles southwest of their current location. Do you want us to try and pull this tow line in? Yeah, Mark, we're back. Mark, that in our It was a very slow and arduous tow to Conway in the conditions that we had because we've got the safety of the vessel to contend with. So it was a very slow, slow tow. It's the safest way. At 1.30 a.m., more than two hours after starting their tow, 
the lifeboat brings the yacht into the estuary, where there's a surprise for the crew as three more casualties emerge from below deck. Just put the loop over, mate. Brilliant, well done. We discovered that there was two gentlemen and, uh, and two young children on board as well. The two youngsters turn out to be the skipper's 10 and 11-year-old grandsons. When we, we saw the kids come out of the wheelhouse, they seemed happy, uh, excited to be with the lifeboat and to, and to be going back to dry land. Are you happy for me to step aboard your vessel? Yeah, are you OK? Everyone all right, yeah? Brilliant. Once all four of the casualties have been checked over for any injuries... He's off, Bart. We'll get this in. The real crew hand them over to the waiting Coast Guard team. I felt a big responsibility for the grandchildren. I don't think they really understood how serious it could have got. It was now night time. It was wet, windy, and we were going nowhere. 75-year-old Brian was taking his two grandsons and his brother on a two-week-long trip from Cumbria to North Wales. I've been sailing for about 40 years. The sail was going quite well, all the way down from Cumbria until we got as far as the wind farm. And at that time, the wind picked up and the sea stay got a bit lumpy. This is when the sail ripped from top to bottom, so a problem. With no mainsail, the yacht soon began to drift towards the wind farm. So started the engine while I went on deck to sort the sail out and I fell on deck and ended up with a, a, a gash in my eye. The children saw the blood on my face so obviously they were concerned for granddad. And then the yacht's engine overheated. My main problem was hitting the wind farm but I was more concerned for my grandchildren than myself or the boat. With no means of power, the yacht was now completely at the mercy of the storm. We started drifting towards the wind farm and I had no way of avoiding them, which could cause very, very serious damage. As darkness was now closing in, Brian alerted the Coast Guard. So I had to make a decision to get them to safety. 30 minutes later, the real lifeboat made it out to Brian's yacht and quickly started setting up a tow. Made contact with the lifeboat crew and they asked me to go onto the foredeck while they arranged to pass over a throw line. Proceeding to the foredeck was very, very difficult. I'm not a young man anymore and it was very, very choppy at this time. I was bounced about quite a lot. We were taking quite a bit of water on board. The grandkids were very cold and very wet. And things didn't get any more comfortable throughout the long tow back. We were sat in the cockpit with my grandson up against the bulkhead and me against him, and my other grandson with my brother up against him. We were trying to keep those protected. All good, yeah? Everyone all right, yeah? Brilliant. Finally, Brian, his grandchildren and his brother were all brought to the safety of Conway Marina. We thanked the uh, lifeboat crew, and the first thing that the grandchildren said was, are we having something to eat now? So we ended up making bacon butties at whatever time it was in the morning uh, for the kids. The skipper of the boat felt a, a mass amount of responsibility for the, for the kids on board. He knew that he, he had to look after them and, and he, he did a good job. It was a bit of uh, elation, thank God for that sort of thing. Um, the yacht's safe, the children are safe on board and uh, it was a really good job well done by all the crew. If the lifeboat crew hadn't have come out, we could have had serious problems with the wind farm. I considered myself quite unlucky in one way, that I had a series of events happening to get us into the situation we got. 
But I also consider myself very lucky that we have the RNLI to come to our problems when they happen. After six hours at sea, the exhausted Rill crew returned to station. By now, it was 3.30 in the morning. After we finished towing the vessel and made our way back to Rill, uh, we had a very busy day in work, uh, a busy night in the lifeboat. Yeah, I was very tired. Two months on from his close encounter with Rill's wind farms, Brian's yacht is still undergoing repairs in Conway Marina. I'm still having problems with the gearbox, so I've bought a completely new control gear, and I'm hoping that that might solve the problem. Really can't wait to get back out there, and looking forward to the kids coming back down again. And they keep asking me, Grandad, when's the boat being fixed? Who wants to go sailing? Having recently lost his wife, Brian's on a promise to keep the yacht, no matter how troublesome it may be. She passed away last year. I think about her every day. It's still pretty raw. So, uh, one of the last things she said, she said, whatever you do, never get rid of that boat, because there's some great adventures for there with you and the grandkids. After breaking her ankle on the rocks near Aberystwyth, Denise is recovering from surgery and still requires help from daughter Jodie. I think she's enjoying me looking after her. I'm just hoping that she doesn't get too used to it, <laughs> personally. <laughs> We're hoping to go back down there. I'm hoping that I can do a lot more walking, but just be extra careful. Once I've got my mobility and I feel confident, with my foot, I will go back on the rocks again. Hopefully not end up on a lifeboat. <laughs> and in Plymouth, old fishing friends Sean, Glenn and Paddy have now sold the boat on which Glenn had his diabetic emergency. And Paddy was incapacitated by seasickness. We bought individual boats, so we go out together, but in different boats, we follow each other, safety in numbers. It's not affected friendship. No. It's not affected at all. It's a friendship is affected is others because they don't invite us out on their boat anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all the boys down the yard who got boats, they all laugh at us, but never stop going out in boats because they like the fish inside of it, you know? At the end of the day, the lifeboat people, they owe my life to them, really. Because they didn't come and get me, I don't think I would have been there. It is very frustrating. With every wave that comes, it holds you back, it slows you down. I felt this almighty pain come throughout my whole body. Just relax, just relax. I just knew something was wrong. Having more of 30 seconds ago, you could relax. All of a sudden, you're back onto a full search mode. 